A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, if only you would put up with a little foolishness from me, please put up with me, for I am jealous of you with the jealousy of God, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts may be corrupted from a sincere and pure commitment to Christ. For if someone comes and preaches another Jesus than the one we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it well enough. For I think that I am not in any way inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am untrained in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. In every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. Did I make a mistake when I humbled myself so that you might be exalted, because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge? <clears throat> I plundered other churches by accepting from them in order to minister to you. And when I was with you and in need, I did not burden anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my needs. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you any, in any way. By the truth of Christ in me, this boast of mine shall not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. Verbum Domini. Your works, O Lord, are justice and truth. <clears throat> I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart in the company and assembly of the just. Great are the works of the Lord, exquisite in all their delights. Your works, O Lord, are justice and truth. Majesty and glory are his work, and his justice endures forever. He has won renown for his wondrous deeds. Gracious and merciful is the Lord. The works of his hands are faithful and just. Sure are all his precepts, reliable forever and ever, wrought in, in truth and equity. Dominus Fobisco. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Mateum. Jesus said to his disciples, In praying, do not babble like the pagans, who think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This is how you are to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. If you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your transgressions. Verbum Domini. The first reading today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And Paul here is struggling with false apostles, as he says a couple verses after this passage. We're not sure who they are, what their identity and mission was. It's not precisely known, but Paul does say some things in, in the letter here about them. One, we know they were Israelites, that they had some letters of recommendation for themselves that they preached a foreign gospel, that they accepted financial support for their services, and that he accuses them of taking advantage of the Corinthians, and that they came in while Paul was away and preached this different gospel. And of course, they were critical of Paul. And he uses the term here, super apostles, obviously, I think, probably in a, a sarcastic way. And he says, though I'm un, because they're they're giving you know, a false spirit, a false gospel, a different Jesus. And he says, though I'm untrained in speaking, I'm not so in knowledge that they come in with a slick message, right? A well-packaged message that convinces some. Paul is laboring. He's struggling, right? He's fighting against these uh, false messages uh, for the church at Corinth. Corinth was a, a wealthy port city in Greece, and it was destroyed, I think, about 150 years uh, B.C., rebuilt by Rome. And he mentions there that they have many pagan gods, and there was a, a temple to the goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And Paul continually, in, this, in these couple letters, he warns against sexual immorality. So apparently that was very rampant there at that time. Paul is jealous, he says, as God is described as being jealous in the Old Testament for his people, for his bride, Israel. He seeks to win her heart. That's the Old Testament imagery that Paul has, uh, that God has this spousal relationship with, with Israel. And this spousal relationship is fulfilled in Christ. And Paul says today, I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And what that means here, the meaning of chaste virgin, is the one that is purely, and he says sincerely, devoted to Christ, admitting to no other loves other than that of Christ, that Jesus is number one in our life. He is first. A heart that puts Christ first in all things, totally dedicated to him. That's what we are all called to be, to have him first in our life. Recently, we know the, in the NBA, the National Basketball Association had its championship. And they go through this grueling season, and even a long playoff season. They got to win the best of seven. And the champion was decided the other night. And the star of the team, the winning team, he was real emotional, right? He's been in the league 17 years. And he said, you know, I've, you know, I've been playing 17 years, and I take one month off a year. And other than that, he's in the weight room twice a day practicing as a shooting coach, just shooting endless baskets and working out. And it struck me, take one month off a year in this grueling physical schedule, right, for this earthly crown. What kind of time and energy do we put into our relationship with God? How much time if he's supposed to be first in our hearts, if he's supposed to be the goal of everything, what do we put into that relationship? 
We know that the world, the flesh, and the devil, as St. John tells us, is always trying to pull us away from this relationship. And Paul refers to this as he says, as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts may be corrupted from a sincere and pure commitment to Christ. We have a, a constant force within us, right? We have a fallen human nature. We have a fallen aspect to the world. And we have Satan and all his minions pulling at us, right? I just can't simply walk to Christ without any effort, without grace. I am going to go into the ditch at some point. I like to say when in my family we were growing up, we had a, a 1977 pacer, right? No power steering, no power anything. And if you weren't vigilant, you would go into the ditch, right? It had no feel for the road or anything. And you were, you know, having to constantly keep this thing. And our, our path is the same, right? We need help to stay on the road. The devil usually doesn't show up with a pitchfork and horns, right? He uses the world and the flesh to tempt us or to at least distract us. Even if he wins uh, our attention, if he causes us to if we fall prey to his snares, you know, just even to lose our peace all the time. Right, he's won a victory. We know the world is good, made by God, but we have to, you know, the worldly spirit approaches the things in the world, the beautiful and good things, in a way that pushes God aside. Right, that's the theme of, of worldliness, that God's no longer number one, these things become false idols to us. You know, we hear in these letters to the Corinthians about Priscilla and Aquila husband and wife, and they were successful tent makers, and Paul worked with them, you know, for a livelihood. And, but they were devout, right? They had a successful business, but they still, they put God number one. They did not push God aside. We know the flesh, you know, this means our disordered desires in a broad sense, to possess, to dominate, to seek pleasure, that again, pushes God aside. They're not brought to be in, to be under the reign of Christ. Ultimately, these things, is they're an expression of the exaltation of the self. And it looks differently in all of us, right? But when we put God aside and put ourself on the throne. And what it leads us to is a slavery to sin and to the evil one. You know, common to all our vocations, intrinsic to our vocation as a baptized Christian, we have to be crucified with Christ. We have to die to self, to put on the mind of Christ, to seek his will and not our own. What pulls us away from a sincere and pure commitment to Christ? We need to examine our, our conscience on this. You know, Paul is warning the people today that some have come and preached another Jesus to you than what I preached to you a different spirit. They've given you a different gospel. Though untrained, Paul preaches the truth. And today, no less today, there are slick voices out there, compelling and powerful, that preach a different gospel. But we know the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that she possesses the fullness of truth and grace. Pope Pius XII wrote in his encyclical on the church, he said that the church you know, has the Holy Spirit and that the, Holy, the principle of every, of every vital and truly saving action in each part of the body is the Holy Spirit. That the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that the Spirit builds up the body in charity and by God's word. You know, by baptism and all the sacraments, confirmation, confession, the Eucharist, it strengthens us, and we receive that Holy Spirit, increases sanctifying grace within us through these sacraments that we find in the church, reunited with God and, one ano uh, and with one another. And through holy orders, Jesus guides his church. Through the successor of the apostles, he governs and guides her. He shepherds her. He's present to her uh, in their ministry. Vatican II in the Catechism makes clear that there are many elements of sanctification 
and of truth that are found outside the visible confines of the church. But it is in the church, the Catholic church, that we find the kingdom of heaven, the reign of God already existing and will be fulfilled at the end of time. That the church proclaims the fullness of the faith that she bears in herself and administers the totality of the means of salvation. We can, we can come and receive her sacraments and receive the grace necessary for our salvation. It is there that we find the true Jesus. We find the full gospel. And we find the Holy Spirit. You know, we need to stay within the church, stay close to her, and we will have a sure guide. We'll be on the bark of Peter uh, sailing to heaven, in a sense, right? And that's where Jesus is, and that's where his truth is.